<laughs> Thank you guys for coming out to Extruple tonight. Uh, my name is Zach Miller. Uh, I run Hatch. Uh, yeah! Woo! Ow! Uh, I also run uh, Silicon Anchor News alongside uh, Keith Brevet. Uh, it's basically uh, an online database of, of different startups and initiatives and events that are going on in the area. Um, and we're really excited for you guys to be here. Uh, Xduple uh, is the best company that's not on Granby Street. Um, <laughs> but still one of the best companies in downtown Norfolk. Really excited for them. You'll hear from Ned Lilly, uh, their president, a little later. Uh, tonight we have seven different presentations. We have Anish Chopra, Donna Harris, let's see if I can remember all these, Ned Lilly, Kristen Fitch, Byron Morgan. Are you singing, by the way? Where is Byron? Every time I see you present, you sing. So you have to sing tonight. Oh, goodness. As long as the crowd participates. You have, a, you have a hat shirt on, so I like that even better. So take off the jacket. You got, so you got to rap, rap, not sing. We also have Gary Warren. And you nailed it. And Marty Kazabowski. I will not be singing. Marty. Oh. <laughs> Did I spell your name right in that last email, Marty? Did I spell your name right in that last email? And I didn't even spell check that, so that's awesome. And it's your dictionary. Well, you don't want to see what my dictionary is. So we're also streaming live uh, on SiliconAcreNews.com backslash live. Backslash again. Uh, if you guys are following us on Twitter, it's hashtag startup VA tour. Uh, and then for any other information, um, and we're videoing. Oh, and we're recording it here. We'll be recording it here, so you'll be able to see all the all the different presentations later. Oh, we're not recording. Yet. Thanks, Keith. Uh, and if you guys are following the hashtag uh, on the non-startup uh, VA tour events, hashtag Start Norfolk uh, is a great place to learn about all the uh, great initiatives and startups going around. So we're going to start off um, with Anish Chopra, who I met about two or three years ago, um, who never stops tweeting. Uh, never stops sure. emailing. You get emails from him at 3 in the morning, and they're, they're very detailed. Um, Anish uh, used to be the former CTO uh, of the United States. Uh, also was very uh, a very big impact in, in starting the Startup America Partnership uh, this time a couple years ago. So, uh, Anish, take it away. All right. Well, thank you very much. All right. Hello, everybody. Celebrate a grassroots movement to help grow entrepreneurs in every corner of the Commonwealth. Donna, Mary, and I have been traveling around. We were in Charlottesville, we were in Roanoke, we were in Blacksburg, we were in Richmond, we we're here tonight, and then we're heading up to Northern Virginia to end it out. What has been exciting over the last week has been just the excitement and enthusiasm at all levels of technological sophistication. We started the tour getting a pitch on a grilled cheese food truck idea, which by the way is going to rock. <laughs> I was like, we, we were all running into like, how do I invest? How do I invest? I want to be there. All the way through uh, some already proven success stories, uh, we met uh, Nathan Latka, who went from two employees when I met him last year in August, to over 50 employees committed over the next year, literally by building a very simple business model. I'm going to help small businesses on Main Street build Facebook fan pages. Simple, easy, profitable, and growing. We need entrepreneurs to be successful in the Commonwealth of Virginia. It is not news to anyone in Hampton Roads that fiscal, whatever you want to describe it, cliff or austerity, over the next decade, we're not going to see a dramatic amount of growth on the government side of the ledger. Statewide, it's 10% of the GDP. Here in the region, it's considerably higher. We need to diversify the economic base. The Commonwealth needs, the, I would argue the region needs, but the Commonwealth needs the region to diversify. That's why Rick is doing the great God's work that he's doing on Innovate Hampton Roads, and why Zach and X Temple and all the teams that are gathering today are on the pace to make a difference. We believe and Donna will share with you momentarily a little bit more detail, that a little sprinkling of Startup America fairy dust will dramatically expand the success rate for the region. Now, I asked Chris Chamura, who's an economist based in Richmond, to tell me the story of Virginia's entrepreneurial ecosystem. Let me share with you a few data points, some good, some bad. 
Well, the, I asked her to go back 10 years. The good news is in 2002, Virginia birthed about 1,000 high expectation startups. That is, startups that were in the tech field that were looking to grow. About 1,000. Over the, over the 10 years ending 2012, 65% failed. Okay, this is a competitive economy. That's, that's the nature of the business. Those that survived accounted for nearly 5,500 jobs. About 350 meant 5,500 jobs. If you do the math, if we increase the shots on goal, that is getting more folks, more folks into the pipeline to try, and lower the failure rate, I believe we can achieve 1,000 successful high growth startups born every year that will result in 100,000 new jobs in the Commonwealth by the end of the decade. Now that only happens if we build an ecosystem not only that provides access to capital, but provides a series of support services, and Donna's going to talk all about that momentarily. Here is the anxiety point that I want to share with you. We in Virginia are the best state for business, best managed state, best pretty much for raising a child. Everything is the greatest. But those indicators are looking at the rearview mirror. I want to dig a little bit deeper into the data to give you a little bit of pause. We're not even ranked in the top 20 in the rate of startups per capita. So number one in a whole range of things, we're not even in the top 20, which is sort of counterintuitive because we've got a great regulatory climate, we have the highest concentration of science and technology workforce, Rick, you can rattle, rattle off all the statistics. We have all the raw material, but the output doesn't quite reflect that. I strongly believe that if we can correct some of these fundamental challenges of translating the talent and the ideas that are here into the marketplace, we will see that transpire. Now, what we learned in Blacksburg and, and Ham in, in, in Charlottesville and in uh, Richmond and Roanoke, it doesn't fit here. We've got a different ecosystem, a different opportunity base. And tonight's conversation is to figure out where and how the energy in this room can take mantle, if you will, take the, take the mantle here and take uh, ownership of Startup America and make it Startup Norfolk, or in, in Zach's case, Start Norfolk, part two, or whatever you want to call it. I have great confidence, part three, part three. I have great confidence we're going to figure this out. I believe Virginia, as you know, we were the birthplace of crowdfunding. You may not know this. It was our political leadership, Senator Mark Warner, Godfather. <laughs> Congressman Eric Cantor, <laughs> Warner and Cantor and Obama walk into a bar. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. <laughs> and they produce the Jobs Act, which will unleash $300 billion in private capital towards early stage companies. I believe if we organize ourselves the right way, we can be the best state in the country to implement crowdfunding in a way that works for us. So I just wanted to say a few words at the front end about where I see this opportunity. I am now going to hand the ball over to Donna, who will give you a deep dive into the Startup America family. We have over 500 companies that have already voluntarily enrolled, and we want to double that, triple that, in the weeks and months to come. Give it up for Donna Harris! <laughs> chant or something, I'm getting so excited. So, first of all, let me start by saying, how many of you in the room, if you're an entrepreneur, how many of you are entrepreneurs, stand up if you are. Yeah! Right, stay standing, don't sit down. Don't Even sit down. says it on my shirt. Yeah, we'll get to that. <laughs> all right, so for those of you who are not standing, our job is to support the people who are standing because they are the job creators in this community, and I want to talk a little bit more about how we make that happen, so you guys can sit down. <laughs> All right, so, so for you, stand up for a second. The reason is this, right here. Can we read this? Read this to them. I make shit happen. <laughs> Entrepreneur <laughs> makes shit happen. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. All right, so whether you... And I'll tweet that, too, so I don't care. But just make a note it was him and not me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. <laughs> 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 All right, 
Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I'm Donna Harris. I'm managing director with the Startup America Partnership, based in Washington, D.C. And Mary Simons, who's sitting up here next to Anise, she and I are on what we like to call the Great Startup America road trip across Virginia. We've learned some really interesting things this week. We didn't know that Charlottesville had become a wedding destination and also had great grilled cheese. That's right. <laughs> we learned that Blacksburg actually is the number one city in the nation if you want to raise a family. We discovered that Richmond is actually the tattoo capital of the country. Yeah. We learned that accidentally, though, by wondering why there were so many tattoo parlors there. Um, and so we hope to learn some interesting facts about the Hampton Roads area today. But more importantly, we hope to learn some facts about your startup community and how we can help you all expand and grow. So, this is me. That's me on Twitter, D. Harris in DC, if you want to give a shout out to Startup America. More importantly, the piece of information on this slide is the website, which is www.s.co. So, for those of you who are standing and you're entrepreneurs, you need to go to s.co and sign up. Why do you need to do that? Ever ship a package? via FedEx? Anyone? Mm -hmm. Take an airplane to go close some business? Anybody use Google AdWords to sell their product? Mm -hmm. Those things are there for you in severely discounted ways. $1,000 worth of Google AdWords, nearly half off of all of your FedEx expenditures. Mm -hmm. Discounts on American Airlines airfare. Hardware discounts, software discounts, and more. All right, how many of you need customers? Yes. I know, it's a crazy question. I love to ask that. People are like, is she crazy asking that? So one of the programs we're rolling out in 2013 is our Corporate Connections Program, which is a partnership with the New York Stock Exchange to get startups connected to America's biggest companies in a way that can help you drive contracts without having to work your way up that wonderful small and mid-sized business division. We've all seen those at work. You can get lost in there pretty quickly. Um, it's a way for us to have corporate America realize that they need to play a role buying some startups and we need to make a dedicated channel to make that happen. So you can't get access to that or any of the resources unless you go sign up. So take care of that after we're done tonight. In fact, if you've got a computer, feel free to take care of it while we're working here. Um, the other reason that you should sign up, and it's the reason that I care the most about it, is that I need to know you exist. I need to know that there are X number of really cool high growth startups in this area. And why do I need to know that? Because I have companies approaching me all the time saying, how can I invest in growing startup communities? Which ones are growing? Which ones are making progress? Where are more companies getting started? Which ones are actually experiencing growth? And my answer right now is, I'm not really sure. Let's sort of feel it out. There's no data available today that says this is the number of high growth startups that we have in our country. So we're interested in tracking how many of you are there and are you growing? Because we want to know if the levers we're pulling to help you are actually helping you. So from our perspective, go get signed up so you can get counted. Today, as of two days ago, there were 506 companies. My guess is there's way more than that that have signed up by now across the, the state of Virginia. So that's sort of what's in it for you if you're a startup. But I want to talk about something broader than that. So don't worry about the eye chart. These are available online. You can read them later. Um, so how many of you have ever heard of the Pando forests in Utah? All right. It was a concept that was new to me as well uh, about a year ago. But when I stumbled on it, I couldn't get it out of my head. So if you think about a startup, a startup is like a tree. You plant your tree. Your tree hopefully grows big, tall and it drops its seeds and it helps sprout out other trees around it, right? Because if a community has one startup and that startup is successful, it spins off people from that company who then go on to start their own companies and so on and so on. So one becomes two and two becomes four and four becomes eight, et cetera. Well, that's great, that's wonderful. We want that to happen. But the Pando tree, it's actually not individual trees in that forest. That is actually one tree. And it's, the reason it's one tree is that it, it has a shared root system. And the root system keeps all of those individual shoots connected so that if some die off, the rest can come back stronger. And that actually is the oldest living organism in the entire world. So you think about if we apply that concept to our national startup ecosystem. How many of you have ever been told you need to move to Silicon Valley? All right, I see some hands here. 
Well, when you think about the jobs numbers, if you look backward at our country the last 30 years, all, nearly all of the net new jobs in our country, they have not come from Fortune 500 companies. They have come from <coughs> companies like the ones you're running. Young, high growth startups that are less than five years old actually have generated nearly all of the jobs in our country in the last 30 years. So if we forward look at how we <coughs> deal with the economic state that we find ourselves in as a country, we need a lot of startups getting started, but more importantly, succeeding and scaling. But if we believe that to be true, it can't be the answer to say, and oh, by the way, you need to move to Silicon Valley to do that. It's just not the answer that's viable. So what we're really focused on is not only helping the individual startups or the individual trees to grow and be successful, we're also helping to strengthen the root system nationally. We're doing that at a local community level through a grassroots initiative that we call the Startup America Regions. Very briefly, this is literally an initiative that is all volunteer. It's led by entrepreneurs. So there's no governmental entity that is saying, I lead this, I run this, here are the initiatives, now go make that happen. Uh, we as an organization are funded by the Case Foundation and the Kauffman Foundation. We're not a government entity, we don't have any government funding. I'm a four-time entrepreneur, I've run three tech companies and a public affairs firm, and I built three of those companies in the technical hotbed of Detroit, Michigan. So I know that not all communities are equal in terms of their support for entrepreneurs. So this is an is initiative to get people like you and me to step up and say, how can I make my community stronger? But instead of having to do it on your own, you can link arms with peers literally across the entire country. So it's a bottom-up, grassroots, entrepreneur-led, open-source initiative that is fundamentally at its heart all about sharing. So as a community is knocking down its barriers and starting to make progress, our expectation is that you won't sit on the golden goose, you will share it with your peers across the country. And likewise, they're expected to share with you, which means that you can go to places like Boulder and Chicago and learn from them. You can tap into idea centers to download the playbooks for the things that they're working on, and upload your own playbooks for the things that you're working on. But it's all about giving and then getting. So entrepreneur-led, really all about getting some stuff done across the country. So we have 30 Startup America regions that have launched nationally. Navy Blue is launched. So Startup Virginia is one of those 30, launched in January, and the Startup Virginia tour that we're doing across the Commonwealth this week is really about trying to mobilize volunteers in each of the key communities across the state. Because frankly, I mean, I'm a Virginia resident, Woo! Yeah. <laughs> I live in Falls Church in the Northern Virginia area. Boo. <laughs> <laughs> she didn't know I was going to get heckled. <laughs> but I can't do this from there for you. You have to do this for yourselves from here. So this is literally the group of peer champions that you have to support you across the country. And literally through technology, through in-person meetups, through online meetups, we're literally connecting over 600 volunteers across the country. There are people like Zach who are already doing things to strengthen the community. So this doesn't supplant or replace anything that is already being done. What it does is provide a platform to unify it and allow you to think collectively as a community. So uh, I, in addition to my role at Startup America, I'm a mom, I have a two-year-old, which is in and of itself a time job. Oh. <laughs> yeah, where's the commentary? Yeah, what's up? He was like, what? Yeah. Uh, and so my son plays with another two-year-old a lot. And if you have ever seen two-year-olds try to put plastic boats in a pool and play, it's a lot of this and no, that's mine, and this hitting and poking and crying eventually ensues. If you think about building a startup community, we're not telling you to create one giant boat of a plan that you all have to get in. Right? So this is not go away, develop a big, thick 20-year plan and stick it in a three-reading binder and you're either on board with the plan or not. That's not what we're advocating. That would be the idea of let's all get in one boat. What we are advocating is pick a point on the horizon that we're all going to sail to. Let's all get in our own boats and figure out what oar we want to pull so that we can grow forward. 
but let's row in the same direction so we're not doing what my two-year-old does when he plays with the girl up the street. Because a lot of boats can sink that way. So let's figure out how we work collectively. So it's very simple. We've built a very high-tech model to help make this happen. Uh, and I just want to really zip through this very quick, very quickly. Entrepreneur-led, that's what you need to know about this slide. We cannot make this work in a community. There are not people like you saying, I'm in. I want to be a leader in my community. And for us, we use the term champion to describe you. So it needs to be you guys stepping up to lead. Second is you've got to agree on the philosophy, which is this is not about hierarchy. This is not about somebody being anointed the Grand Poobah of Startup Virginia. This is about a network of people in the community all collectively agreeing to collaborate to improve the community. It's also about what's on his shirt. Like I said, it's not about analysis paralysis. It's about getting some stuff done. So we ask you to err on the side of get stuff done. Identify a problem. Let's go fix it. It might fail. That's OK. We'll try something else. Keep the things that work. Throw out the things that don't, but just keep experimenting to improve the ecosystem. And literally make it open. So anyone in the community who says, boy, I really wish our community did a better job of this, and here's my idea. The answer isn't, well, go get Zach's approval, and Zach will call Mary, and Mary will call Donna, and we'll figure out whether we're going to do that. The answer is, awesome, go do it. There's no permission structure. In fact, right now I'm anointing all of you, leaders, Start at Virginia. Congratulations, you've all been promoted. So there, there isn't hierarchy. It's literally a community-wide initiative. Now, what in the world do these regions work on? Very simple stuff. Capital. How do we get more money flowing in our community? Not necessarily how do we get the Silicon Valley venture capital firms to come here, though that might be something you want to do. How do we unlock the wealth that's here and get it investing in our community? How do we get more mentors for our startups? How do those startups know who those mentors are and get connected to them? How do we build density in our community so that you don't go 10 miles before you stumble into another entrepreneur? You go 10 feet before you stumble into someone who might be able to help you with your business. Um, how do we make sure that we are connecting our corporations in the community to the startups? Because guess what? They have engineering talent. They have the ability to help you prototype your product. They can be customers. They have office space you can use. They have capital they can put in. So the list is nine things. It's up to you guys to decide which of these things you want to work on. You work on all of them. You can work on one of them. Or you can decide there's something that's not on this list you want to work on. That's fine, too. This is not meant to be prescriptive. And then last but not least is celebration. If we think about how we think about our communities, why people don't invest in the startups in our community, why some of our young people leave to go to other cities to do their startups. Oftentimes, it is a celebration problem. What I mean by that is they don't know there is a vibrant community in their backyard. The world doesn't know about the incredible activity going on here. The, st the startups that are being successful are not being celebrated in the place that the general public would be hearing their stories. So part of what we encourage you guys to think about is, What's the story we're telling? What's the story of our community? And how are we telling that locally? How are we telling that across the Commonwealth? How are we telling that to our lawmakers, the people who have money? How are we telling that nationally? How many of you have ever been covered by the Wall Street Journal? Very few of you. So if the Wall Street Journal called me today and said, is there anything going on in Hampton Roads? What's the story there? What would I tell them? We need to have a marketing story around what's happening here so that the excitement that you all feel about what's happening here is something that is packageable in a way that the people who want to hear the story and talk about it can receive it. So celebration is something we ask you really to think a lot about. So I want to give you a couple of really super quick examples so we can zip through this. So the idea of Summit is something a number of our regions have done either virtually or in person, which is you identify a problem in your ecosystem, let's say capital. How do we get more rich people in Hampton Roads investing in startups? Rather than feeling like everyone in this room here has to be the, the people to figure this out, let's issue a community challenge. Let's use the entrepreneurial skills and let's hack this problem as a community. 
So that's what a number of our regions have done. Sort of DC did it, sort of North Carolina did it, we have some local cities that are doing it, in a way that it says, this is open. Anybody can come up with a solution for this. So that's one idea. This is sort of DC. Now, it doesn't matter what it says, I want to show you the structure. What they did was they said, here are the things across the top in light blue that we know we need to be strong at in our community. So they were things like capital, talent, mentoring, et cetera. So they started by identifying what of that list of nine things were important to them. Down the side, they identified startups, brand new companies less than five years old, and scale-ups, which are basically more than five, but not quite you know, ready for the Fortune 500. What is it that they need, and how can we help them? What they then identified was those in light blue and italics, that's where there's already somebody or an organization tackling that thing. And it helped them start to identify places that they could ignore for now, or even more importantly, organizations they should be celebrating and raising the profile of. And it also helped them to identify where the gaps were. So big gap here, which is capital. It's a huge issue for them. So we went through some exercises with them to figure out how do we unlock the wealth that's in the DC area. So, it helped them to identify where to spend their energy versus the organizations that were already doing great work in those areas. They then created this, which is their path to success. All those organizations that were in italics and light blue, they created a map that looks a little bit like sheets and ladders, so you can figure out how you navigate. And for this, that, that was a way for them to help the startups figure out the lay of the land. So they weren't going to waste cycles trying to figure out if I need mentoring. Who do I call? So this work for them might not work in another community. So every community decides to do something different. This is the one that gets really interesting. So they did what any MBA marketing exercise would do, which is they segmented their wealth in their community. Where's the money? Where are the pockets of wealthy people? And what do they put their money in now? What's Rick's their behavior? <laughs> Turns out in DC, we've all heard of this great place called K Street Capital K Street, which is where all the lobbyists hang out. And they've got pretty strong density of lobbyists. You can't go 10 feet without bumping into a lobbyist on K Street. Guess what? If you look at lobbyists, they're millionaires. They are accredited investors. But none of them are investing in a startup ecosystem. Well, what are they investing in? Restaurants. Restaurants are fun. My friends invest in restaurants even though they know they're going to lose their money. <laughs> the other behavior that was really interesting for the community to realize was these people don't hesitate to bring a $2,500 check to dinner when it's a fundraiser for a politician. Now, if we take those two characteristics and we say, how do we turn that into something that works for startups? What if we had private dinners that are clubby and fun and exclusive, and we require them to bring a $2,500 check to dinner, and we worked with a local accelerator to pre-screen companies. Three companies come and pitch over appetizers. They go away during dinner. We chat and we discuss the merits of each. The companies come back over dessert, and we hand one of them a $50,000 check. <laughs> they love it. It's become the greatest thing since sliced bread on K Street. Everyone wants in. And it's literally all about using the community uh, you know, looking and understanding the community. So this works for them. So it's starting to think about your own community and how do you begin to solve the problem locally. And this is how they're organized, which literally, I've seen two really great examples of this. They put their initiatives across the top. Here's all the stuff we could possibly work on. And all the people down the left that said, I want to help. And then they made everybody put an X on the thing or things they were willing to actually work on. The things that didn't get any Xs got thrown out. And the things that had people on them, that's the initiative that began to take root. Their measure for whether somebody could be a champion wasn't, are they iconic? Have they formed three versus four companies? It was the logo on this shirt. Were they getting shit done? If there are people who are she getting said stuff done. She said it. She said it. <laughs> that's their measure. So it's really all about who is actively engaging. One other example I want to show you real quickly, which is Startup Maryland. This is Mike Binko. He's the CEO of CloudTrack, which is the software company in Maryland. 
Love the the guy travels <laughs> everywhere with his helmet. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> Under Armour is based in Maryland. They're one of Maryland's iconic success stories. And they have this Under Armour Maryland brand, Maryland Pride. The Startup Maryland team has adopted it. And they decided that they wanted to wrap a bus in the logo, drive around the state. And everyone thought they were insane. <laughs> Nobody could understand why you would ever do that. They had a hard time finding sponsorships. We helped them make that happen. They started driving the bus around the state of Maryland. They thought they might go and meet about 50 startups. What they did is they equipped the bus with a video studio in the back. And any startup in the state could pitch on the bus. And they called it Pitch Across Maryland. <coughs> and what they were doing was creating a pitch contest. But it was a rolling pitch contest. 150 companies pitched. They literally hit every nook and cranny of the state. The governor was clamoring to pitch on the bus. <laughs> this is an example of, let's do something bold and crazy and we might fall on our face. They got incredible national press for the Maryland ecosystem from this. They got covered in a lot of the national publications and they have now reporters paying attention to what's happening in their community. So, bold, crazy idea for celebrating the community and it turned out to be a big success for them might not work here, but a good example. Last one I want to show you real quickly. This is the start of Tennessee. This is a state that has said, our huge issue is celebration. There's a lot going on, particularly in Nashville, Memphis, and Chattanooga. But if you were to look at press coverage of startups plus Nashville a year and a half ago, you'd get nearly a goose egg. If you were to do that now, in fact, yesterday they were just named one of the top communities for entrepreneurship in the country. They made the top 20 for the first time in the PricewaterhouseCoopers Money Tree Report. It is due in great part to this. They have a focus on this, 675 news articles and press coverage. They have somebody who is sitting here thinking about how do I tell the story of what's happening in Tennessee? every day, all day, in front of all the places that make a difference. And it's moving the needle. Not just in terms of press coverage, that's great, we got press coverage. They're getting capital for their companies. They're getting national coverage. There are companies coming to Nashville, like Google, saying, how do I reach your startups? So it can be an important way to start thinking about how to move the needle. So, I'm done. This is the how you make it happen fancy model, which is what how are we doing as a community? What are the strengths? Do we have entrepreneur leaders? Do, are we aligned around this philosophy? How, can we work on some of these things to improve the community? And are we celebrating what's happening across the community? Start of Virginia is a mechanism to do that. So for those of you who are interested in playing a role in making these things happen, we would encourage you to step up and become a champion and get engaged in the conversation of Start of Virginia. We can have lots of Q&A afterwards. Mary and I can answer questions. But those of you who are interested should come and find these two fine gentlemen and make sure they know you're interested so we can start to think about where do we go from here. Make sense? Any questions before I yield the floor to the hecklers? <laughs> All right. Thanks very much, everyone. Well, it, was, it was truly... Uh, you know, Startup America really is an elite uh, program, and if you guys haven't already signed up, do it. Don't wait. Just go. It's three letters on your computer. S dot C O. That's it. Um, next up, so thank you guys for, for being so awesome. Um, next up, we have uh, Byron Morgan, um, founder of Biomint, who uh, over the last uh, probably year, year and a half, has become one of my best friends. Oh, Aww. that's so sweet. <laughs> yes. 20 bucks, come on. Say it. Uh, he always wears uh, some sort of uh, velvety. Uh, <laughs> what is that nice? That's so velvet, right? Uh, you may have seen him at Demo in San Francisco or at TechCrunch uh, Disrupt, uh, launching Vinyl Mint at both of those um, exclusive events. Uh, has a company called Vinyl Mint that uh, is disrupting the music industry uh, for collaboration reasons. Um, and uh, was one of the uh, first uh, hatch links in this summer's program at Hatch. And uh, Hatch Five. Hatch Five. We stole that 
from Michigan and the Fab Five. Um, I got a book for you. I think you actually already stole mine this no, summer. That's Bo Turner. Bo Turner. So here's this. I don't have this, the fancy Startup America version. Oh, this is awesome. Um, so maybe it's signed worth like 50 more bucks. But So Byron Morgan, take it away. And he may sing in the middle of this. Please don't walk out. He does have a tendency to, to sing uh, in his presentations. <laughs> Well, first of all, I want to say, uh, let's celebrate the entrepreneurs by giving everybody a round of applause. Yeah! And um, I have no PowerPoint, so I'm just going to talk, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I want to kind of keep this as a dialogue as well, right? Uh, that's that's kind of my style. Because not only do I love to talk and teach but I also, as a professor, but I also like to learn from the crowd. So um, there's four key points that I kind of want to hit on tonight, right? The first is... One, I want to talk about why we need to support the creative class and the accelerators and startups in the area. Second thing is, is I want to talk about why it's important to find good talent and how to identify those things. Next is creating a board of advisors, right, and why that's important. And then the last piece is, is how all this ties into launching your product. So first and foremost, to give you a little background about myself, my name is Byron Morgan. I started a company called Vinylman in 2011. Um, it was a project my senior year of college. Um, my professors thought I was crazy for, for wanting to start a recording studio. And then one day, a gentleman in this room, actually, I don't know if he's still here, um, he, uh, he found this idea in my business plan um, about building a technology that would help wire basically the recording studio and allow the recording studio to collaborate with individuals within the studio without having to be in the same studio. He was like, that'd be great, but nobody's, you, you, you're fucking ridiculous if you think Ooh. somebody's gonna, oh, I'm sorry for driving that. Oh. Yeah! <laughs> he said, he basically, basically what he said is, he said you'd be crazy if you think somebody's gonna give you some money to create a brick and mortar establishment and you're 21. So basically what I did is I took the technology and I, I, I went and worked in the recording business for about two years with uh, some executives and started pitching the idea about how uh, we could essentially collaborate with other people around the country or around the world without having to be in the studio. What are cost efficiencies that we, we, we could provide um, uh, uh, these companies outside of just looking for digital distribution channels? Here lied the opportunity to create the product known as Vinyl Men today. Um, so what I've done since then, uh, I came back to the area because, again, one of the most important things, um, as, as um, uh, Donna said earlier, was going back to my network right? That of people that would support what I was doing or allow me to access their networks to grow my company. Right? Whether that had been professors from college, whether that had been um, just being able to network with other business professionals in the area, or being able to grab somebody's time and attention um, to just pitch my idea to tell me if it was stupid, another party cop, <laughs> to catch my attention to see if it was, if it was a stupid idea or if I, it had some merit. So that was one of the first things that I did when I came back to the area. In doing so, I discovered a couple of things. First and foremost is that Norfolk, or Hampton Roads in general, is full of phenomenal talent. You don't have to be in a New York, you don't have to be in a San Francisco or, a, a, or, or uh, in Austin to do great things in the, in the area. So that was one thing that I learned. Second thing that I learned is that there is a lot of wealth in this area. And then the third thing that I learned is that in this area as well, there's an energy and a support unlike any of those areas that I've ever been in. So what that did was that allowed me to springboard my, my, uh, springboard my idea. I immediately got hooked up with people like Zach Miller, Marty Kazbowski, uh, I mean, uh, Clint Dalton even, uh, who, who kind of brought me into the creative space and allowed me to kind of just flourish there. And, and from that, those I, that basically gave me that foundation that I needed to push forward. So let's talk about my next point, uh, which was growing your management team. So one of the key things that I learned when I, when I got into Hatch was the importance of how to build, how to build a team, right? Because it's, it's enough to just have resumes and people that are important or, or people that have a name or are iconic or have done things before. It's, it's, it's more important to have a culture, right? It's more important to have a relationship with these people that, 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 is, symbi that is one, symbolic, two, shared in your vision, and three, 
if the ship is sinking, they're going to sail with you to the, to the bottom of the ocean. You know? So that's, th those things were important. And that was one of the things that we needed to, one of the things that I identified when being in there. One of the other things was also getting strategic partners, right? Um, and I also see a good friend in the room, uh, Patik Grace, <laughs> who, was, who had become a strategic partner in helping to build the actual technology itself. So identifying those pieces, because what those things do is, first of all, if you don't have money, you can lean on this team, because most of the time they're going to be working for equity and pizza, right? <laughs> and beer. <laughs> uh, and beer. And beer. And Hennessy. And, uh, and, and uh, the other thing is that they will also allow you to, to, to take cost efficiencies, so subsidizing the cost of developing things. Um, and th that's extremely important when starting a business, right? Because everybody knows you're either working two or three jobs trying to basically pay, pay for this, or you're working a job and you're burning the midnight oil, and you're, 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 at work, you're work, at work working six hours a day or four hours a day, and the other four hours a day you're working on your startup. Well, you need to share that energy and spread that energy around to, to, to other people who share your vision because it's important for them to carry on forward. The, the other part of that, now moving into my third point, is building the board of advisors, right? And the board of advisors is important for a number of reasons, but the one point that I'm going to hit on today is because they're going to always keep it, what we always say, 100 with you, right? They're going to tell you when you have stupid ideas, they're going to tell you when you have great ideas, and then they're going to be the people that help unlock the doors, help you to access capital, help you to get the relationships, help you to meet the mayor, help you to meet the people that are going to, or customers that are going to help you move your business forward. So. That was one of the things that was really important to me when coming back, and I identified some of those people. And, and one key thing that entrepreneurs need to keep in mind when identifying those key people is you need to find those people that are going to be one, like I said, allow you to access relationships. The other part is the, they're going to be able to help you shape the strategic plan. They'll be sitting down next to you when you have no idea about what you're doing, or they'll be the people that will basically help you think about ideas or think about your vision in a different way, right? And oftentimes, that was one of the things that I, uh, that I, had, I had in my, my, in my own, was just figuring out, okay, I, I have these relationships with people in the music industry, right? You can make a phone call and, and then you're, you're in front of 10,000 people. Well, but what is that really, what, how, did, how do you build a mutually beneficial relationship and how do you go deeper into that relationship? Well, they'll help you go deeper into those relationships. They'll help you understand how to build those partnerships. Um, and then lastly with them is that those are the individuals that will go to bat for you, right? They'll be your references. And in the, in, as a young startup, that's one of the most important things that you can have is having references, having somebody that will sit in a meeting with you or take phone calls with you, right? And then the last thing is like launching your product. One of the most important <coughs> things that I learned, um, and I would hear Zach always say this, it, it rings in my head every time we do a new version launch, is um, ideas achieved, execution is everything, right? Just do it, right? Just get out there and do it. Feet to the pavement, whether it be making phone calls, a lot of times it's just, it, it's just that energy and that initiative of going out there and making things happen, or going out there and meeting people without a regard for how you look, what, you, what you're into, your interests, just going out and meeting people. Those are the most important things when, 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 uh, when getting things off the ground. And uh, I mean, I, I can be a, I, I'm a testimony for that with the, with the successes that we've had in, in 2012 and where we'll be going in 2013. So, I mean, that's all I have. And, uh,
tonight. But uh, seriously, Steve Blank uh, offers an online class to uh, Udemy, a U G E M Y dot com. Uh, it takes you all all through the process of starting a company. Uh, really great stuff. It's free, uh, so I strongly recommend doing that. So you guys might be sitting here wondering, okay, you know, where has this community really gone? So I'm about to tell a story. This guy's left. Sean. Oh, I'm not telling the story anymore. Oh. <laughs> he is done. <laughs> Never mind. All right, let's find someone else to tell the story. Hey, get the horse in. <laughs> the horse in. Get the horse in. All right, there you go. All right, so about this time last year, we had our first event called Start Norfolk. Uh, a lot of people said, you know, this is crazy, this shit will never, never work here. Uh, a lot of the big businesses, a lot of the, the old business guys just like, uh, you guys are full of shit, this, this will never work. Uh, so we have it in a room probably the size of this. Uh, we had 175 people show up, 37 different ideas were pitched. And, and one of the people there was Sean Evangelista, who uh, is currently in the military. And uh, he, he, he's since told me the story that, you know, about a week before, he's sitting around the campfire with his guys going, uh... What the hell am I going to do when I get out of here in 18 months? So he goes to start Norfolk. He doesn't pitch. He just sits there. Him and his wife, Joanne, uh, for, for the full three days. And he, he sits there afterwards, and um, he's like, wow, I, I think I know what I'm going to do now. Monday, he comes to my office and says, I don't know what I want to do yet, but I want to start a company. Uh, he then pitched his company at the next start Norfolk, got second place. And then about a month, month and a half later, we accepted him into the, uh, the, acceler uh, the accelerator program Hatch uh, and has since told me that he was going to move to Lake Tahoe uh, to just sit out there and, and do what Navy guys do, I guess. Uh, but now is committed to, to staying uh, in Norfolk and, and continuing to see this community grow. Uh, so you might ask yourself, why do this? You know, Sean Evangelista is a, is a, is a great example as to why I do this because this is our community, and we can we can grow it. You don't have to go anywhere else in the world to do it. You can do it right here. It's the passion. It's the drive to do it, and you'll see it. So, Sean, you can get this book for being awesome and doing everything. His company is Podium Pro. Uh, they have a suite of applications that helps public speakers uh, give presentations. I probably should be looking at notes while I'm giving this. <laughs> but I actually gave my iPad to Chris Maku, uh, who has a company, GM Engineering Services who's going to the New Orleans work boat show next week and need it. So, guys, this is our heroes right here. I mean, he's going to stay here. He was going to leave. He's been here for 20 years and was going was to leave the area, but now will be here forever, and will we'll be one of the most successful companies. <laughs> 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 Some of you guys might say, oh, you know, capital isn't available in this area. You can't raise money. Uh, that's bullshit. You can definitely raise money in this area, whether you're wearing a suit or not, or half suit or half not, whether you're from Detroit or you're not from Detroit. They like University of Michigan and you don't. A lot of you guys know Marty Kaspowski. His football team. His football team isn't worth shit. His basketball team is worth shit. No, wait. No, wait. The football team lost to the number one team, the number two team, the number three team. Right, and the team's going to win the Big Ten. Go blue. Well, no team can win the Big Ten. They're all if there can be a good eight and four season, this is it. Yeah. <laughs> so, if you guys don't know Marty Kaspowski, I, I believe John Biggs of TechCrunch called him the Godfather. Was that the right? No, yeah. uh, startup legend. A startup legend. Yeah. <laughs> start <-up> legend. Yeah. <laughs> that just means I, I've, I've lived long enough to outlive everybody's memories. <laughs> <laughs> so Mar Marty's putting together a very significant fund right now that will be launching in the next few weeks, uh, and he'll be talking a little bit how he's been able to uh, not only raise that money, but uh, see these last few years, last uh, 20 years. As he's always told me it's a 20-year plan. I told him he's full of shit, but uh, you know, he's, he's uh, an example as to why to keep pushing, and uh, thank you for everything, Marty. Okay. Uh, yes, um, when Zach asked me to talk, um, he asked me to talk about seed capital, and I'll spend about five seconds talking about that. Yes, we have started a new seed capital fund, and I can't tell you a lot about it because the SEC doesn't like when you do that in a public forum. Yes. <laughs> yes, I know, but we have some guys working on the, on the deal. Uh, but we are up and running, and we're doing the things that you would do if you had started a seed capital fund. And with any luck, sometime in the first quarter of next year, we'll be doing the other things you do when you start a seed capital fund, which is invest in companies. So stay tuned for all of that. But to the point that Donna made earlier, you know, this was one of those issues that we have dealt with, tried to deal with, for the last 20-something years. People have said forever that, wow, we need some, some seed capital in this region. 
So a couple of them were sitting around um, in a coffee shop of all places and said, let's just do stuff. By the way, I want to be the first speaker not to actually swear. I was swearing when you were in diapers. <laughs> So, so we really were just sitting around saying it's time for somebody to do something on this topic. So let's just try to start something. Now we started with a, a different model. We were going to do an angel group. We were going to do a club. All, all different sorts of things. And we were waiting for Dodd Frank to kind of fix itself. But finally it became clear that fun was the right thing to do. So we just did it. And away we go. And we may fail. <laughs> but uh, right now we've got some momentum. We've got some pretty high profile investors who think we're going to be successful. And, and keep your fingers crossed. And, and Look for some announcements fairly soon. Enough of that. <clears throat> what I really want to talk about, though, is community. Because, as we've said, community is what makes this happen. And I am one of the guys who's been around for a long time. And I want to be the first one to shout out to Ned. Here we are in the great next duple thing. We started an incubator in 1998. We're one of the first technology incubators in the country. Certainly the first one here in Hampton Roads. Ned was one of my early clients. It was Ned and his crazy partner. No longer with us. No longer with us. Ned was a little crazy, but not as crazy as the partner. We helped him with some space. We helped him with some mentoring. We helped him with some, uh, some funding. We helped him with a lot of different things. And it's taken him 10 years to become an overnight sensation, but here he is. Doing great things. So, so shout out to Ned. Here's what I want to say, and I'm going to get off and let the other guys talk. I like to talk about community because of what makes all this happen. I have a 16-year-old daughter. She's 16 going on about 25. Okay. And she's taken an environmental <laughs> science class this year, her junior year in high school. And we were just studying the other day, and I was learning a lot about ecosystems. And we've all started to use this metaphor of an ecosystem for this kind of a community. And one of the things I learned, which I probably learned when I was a junior in high school and forgot, but one of the things I relearned is that what makes an ecosystem work is that every single participant in the ecosystem benefits from the participation of every other participant in that ecosystem. Mm -hmm. We all benefit because we're all in the system doing our thing. Okay? It's taken Hampton Roads a very, very, very long time to figure that out. And Rick will, will um, back me up here. If we tried to do this in 2003, 2002, we probably could not have gotten this kind of energy in a room together. We'd gotten Steve Goad and a few other guys. I know you did. So what I, what, I want to, what I want to challenge all of you to do is remember that. Remember that all of us benefit because all of us are participating in this ecosystem. We all have roles to play. Now I was going to shout out a couple guys in particular. I was really hoping Phil Walzer was still here. He's the reporter from Hampton Road, from the, the pilot. Everybody from the press, to the money guys, to the entrepreneurs, to the marketers, to the consultants, all of us have a role to play. So before you go to bed tonight, think a little bit about how you're going to help this ecosystem, help this community grow. I do want to say one last thing. I want to shout out to Sean now. <laughs> I, I've been complaining to CIT for about a generation, <laughs> about not showing up down here, not being part of our community. So Sean and I were at a conference the other day, we actually was, uh, listened to Anish talk and, and then Senator Warner was talking, and we were out in the hall ignoring both of them. Oh man! <laughs> <laughs> and and one of the local guy, one of an entrepreneur from uh, Williamsburg, came up and talked to us, and we we're talking. And I was talking about how you know, Hampton Rose is doing this, and it's great to see a Williamsburg guy. And Sean used the word "we" in the context of Hampton Rose. Yeah. <laughs> We have managed to get a CIT guy from Northern Virginia to come here and think of this as his community. How cool is that? Well done. So I want to shout out to you guys. I want to show all you guys for showing up. Remember that this is all one big happy family. We're all listening together. Let's make the pie bigger. Let's grow the community and do good things. Amen. It's funny because Marty has really been saying that about CIT. And I'm like, no, I love CIT and I love Sean. And then I usually call Sean and say, we're still hating you. Yeah. And then we get an email a little later, but CIT is awesome and still obviously say no to all <laughs> you, you won't be in 2013, we'll tell you that. So, uh, I met Marty uh, probably about two years ago, um, and he, he is one of my uh, strongest mentors, so I, I really am 
you know, in the time of Thanksgiving and everything, you know, I'm very thankful for Marty. Uh, if you guys aren't familiar with co-working spaces, one of the best co-working spaces in the state of Virginia, if not the uh, entire nation, is the uh, 757 Creative Space downtown 259 Granby Street. Clint Dalton uh, and his wife run it. Um, what's the website, Clint? Uh, if you're looking for an office, if you're looking to get out of your house, 757creativespace.com. It's an awesome place to, uh, to get some work done and uh, a beautiful facility there. So next up, uh, we have actually our, uh, our host, Ned Lilly, who uh, you guys are sitting on all of his chairs and, and, and drinking his beer. Chairs. Go ahead. Some of them are your chairs. Some of them are Hatch's chairs. <laughs> Only about ten. Um, sorry. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, Ned, Ned is a great example as to why I keep pushing. His company is about 10 years old, uh, and this year alone, the growth has been uh, absolutely incredible. Uh, since Start Norfolk alone, I think he has hired like seven employees, uh, and they met a lot, two, two or three of them from Start Norfolk. Uh, so, you know, these, these community events really are a huge impact uh, to our region and, and to, you know, the downtown area of Norfolk. Um, very happy to, to be very close with Ned and very happy to be close with the, the game here at X Duplin. And, and Ned's going to talk about a little bit about his adventure over the last 10 years, 20 years, 30 years of being an entrepreneur. Um, and just how he's, he's only 31 years old. I'm a very youthful 31. Yes. So think, uh, Ned Lilly, please. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to be really, really, really quick. And if, but I, I wanted to. Um, Seize on one thing that Anisha in his talk, and I'm blanking on the numbers already. He talked about the the, uh, uh, the number of Virginia companies that started in 2002. 1,000. Okay, so that was that, and that was us plus six months. We wow. we, we launched in a fit of optimism a couple of weeks after 9/11, um, which yeah, it turns out wasn't the absolute best time to start a company, but <laughs> yeah. uh, it's the worst time. <laughs> but here we are, right? Yeah. Yeah. And and I was I was trying to do the math in my head. Can you give, can, you, can you do the numbers off the top of your yeah. head again? So like sixty five percent failure rate. Okay. The three fifty that survived had fifty five hundred jobs. So that's fifteen ish per 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 success. All right. So we've doubled that You're that three. average. You're thirty. Hey, bro. Hey, bro. Thirty five people. Hey, congratulations. So we're in the in the past twelve months we've doubled again. Almost every uh, every way, uh, uh, re revenues, people, space. I mean, this is all all uh, all kind of fun. So, but but as Marty can attest, I mean, it, it, it takes you know much much longer than you think, and um, uh, so that that's my. Uh, if I had to put if I had to put one thing out there for people to to bear in mind as you're going over your business plans and your hockey stick revenue uh, projections and everything. It will take longer than you think. Um, so plan for that. But uh, but having said that, I mean, it, it's just very quickly what we do. Um, we're uh, uh, business management software. So that's, that's accounting, CRM, inventory, uh, uh, purchasing, the whole shoot and match. If you've heard a phrase, uh, three letter acronym, TLA, called ERP, Enterprise Resource Planning, that's what we do. What makes it different, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's oh, we, are, we are in the cloud, we are getting more in the cloud, we are, but, but it's, but it's, the other thing that's, that's kind of different about us is that we're open source. And so uh, if you've heard that phrase, it means there's a free version, you can go and download it um, off of a bunch of different places on the web. It's been downloaded a million times, it's been translated into 27 different languages, localized in 50, 60 different countries around the world. So it's, um, and you might kind of scratch your head and say, well, how do you make money with this free software? That seems kind of dumb. And, but it kind of goes back to some of the same things you've been hearing tonight about community. So we've got a global community of people that are using this software, you know, and, and for every one company that, that ends up buying a commercial license from us or buying, it comes to a training class in our big training room upstairs or or you know, engages us for some kind of professional services or something. There's hundreds and hundreds of companies that are using the free version. And some number of those people kind of get to that same calculus where the Marty was talking about where you say, 
this whole thing is going to grow and become more valuable if I give back something for what I've gotten for free. Mm -hmm. And so that is that that is open source fundamentally. That is, it's it's integral to our business model. It's how we've got an application that really, really, really compares favorably to stuff from companies like Microsoft and SAP, you know, which you know are not small companies. Now, not, now if you, you sit down and you think, well, I'm, gonna write, I'm a software company, I'm going to write down my list of you know, potential competitors. <laughs> Microsoft, SAP, Oracle, you know. So, but but that, it's, that's, uh, it's, it's a pretty cool thing to see all these people uh, kind of roll up their sleeves and getting involved with the development of our product. And by our product, I mean it's theirs too. And so that's, that's what we do in a nutshell. It's, I think, why we're um, having, the, having the growth we are. And, um, you know, if anybody that is starting a business, um, if anybody in Startup America uh, uh, wants to talk to anybody that's starting a business that needs something besides QuickBooks to start the company, mm -hmm. it's free. So, thanks. Thanks for coming. Yeah. Talk about you know the entrepreneur-led net is is the example of it, uh, and we cannot thank him enough for, for doing everything that he has, sticking with it uh, for as long as he has. Um, a little bit about the numbers. Uh, I think the numbers are in the country. Fifty-five percent of the jobs are started, or fifty-five percent of jobs are created by startups and small businesses. In our state alone, it's about 70 75 percent, and I believe actually in our region, it's ninety-five percent of jobs are created by small and startup businesses. So that should be everyone in here, uh, to my knowledge. So you guys are creating the jobs. So it's it's our job to create those jobs and continue to do this. So thank you guys for, for doing that. Um, thank you, Rick Lally. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next up, we got two more to go. Uh, we have Kristen Fitch, who has recently launched uh, another one of her products on the App Store. Um, Roho, it's a word game that actually is pretty damn addicting. Uh, I found myself uh, playing it uh, the Friday after Thanksgiving for, for several hours. And um, she's going to talk a little bit about uh, one of her previous companies where she thought she had to give everything day one. And what she actually needed to do was, was uh, concentrate on the core of the product. Uh, so Kristen Fitch, uh, you're up. First, thanks to Zach and X Tuple for uh, making sure that we, our community was involved or participating in Start Up America's tour. Thank you to Donna and Anish and Mary for coming. We definitely appreciate it and we're glad to be on the, the map. So, thank you. Uh, let's see. So, there's three things I want to focus on. Real quick, storytelling. I want to, I, I like, you know, that point of, I think part of our, what our community needs to do is tell stories about each other, our businesses, the success stories. Not just your own business, but we really need to be the conduit between other businesses, you know, and, and sharing those successes. So that's the first thing I want to touch on. The next thing is I want to talk about my observations in this community and what I'm seeing and sort of some things that I think are um, things as a startup business myself, things that I think aren't necessarily true and how I think if you're a startup or you're looking to start your own business and things I think that are valuable uh, ideas for you. And the last thing is my lessons learned with product development. So the first is storytelling. So many of us that have been coming to these events have heard about some of the successes, like the Hatch Five. But for instance, one thing I'm excited about, and I don't know if he's still here. Josh, are you still in here? No, okay. Well, locally in our area, the brewing business has really come about. And even though that's not a tech startup, I'm excited that we have that story to tell. Charlottesville, Charlottesville has been big on that success area. Well, now we, in, in the last two months, we have two brewing companies that have started in our community. Back Bay Brewing, who was here tonight, and then Smart Mouth, and of course we have O'Connor's. So the point is, the more we spread that story about those breweries, or obviously the tech stories, the uh, clean energy stories, the more that our communities are saying, wow, all these businesses are here. If I'm looking at starting a company in that, I can go and connect with those people, because now I've heard about them. So I think one thing we're doing a much better job of in the last year to two years versus five, ten years ago is, we're starting to connect and we're starting to share those stories about other businesses. To me, that's super exciting, but I think we have to do a better job of it. 
So, you know, I don't want to hear just about the Hatch 5 businesses. I want to hear about every one of your businesses in here, and I want to find a way to connect all of those together. And obviously, I'm doing my part to do that. Weekly, I'm at Hatch, you know, helping out in every way I can to make sure that we, we move the community forward. Okay, so that's, that's my little storytelling um, background. The next thing is community. So, first of all, I'm excited that we have this many people in the room because I've been in tech since two, um, 1998, and let's be honest, I would go to some events that happened at that time, but it was mostly salespeople and a couple tech people. So I'm really excited to be able to go to networking events where it's mostly tech and entrepreneurs and businesses. So for me, that's huge because most of my friends aren't in tech anymore. You know, they've moved out of it or they were, were never in it. So I'm excited for that. But we have to keep doing this. We have to keep showing up to those events, whether it's an event that, that Zach has helped spearhead or whether it's an event that your business is having or helping to facilitate. So keep coming. Keep coming to those events. Keep going to things. As far as things that I think, uh, this, as far as being a startup that, I guess you could call them myths. And those of us that do a lot of reading have heard these things before. But for my own personal uh, experiences, what I've found is, first of all, you don't need to raise capital, obviously, to start a business. You know, you can either keep your, your business, your job, and, keep, and do it on the side, or you can just go grow slowly. And I would say that's what we've done. You know, we've been in business for uh, four years. And yes, we had to grow, grow slower, but we're still having successes. It's just going to take longer to get to where we want to go. So we've had millions of people come to our national website, which is ZiggityZoom.com, and it reaches families, kids, and parents. And then we've ro rolled out lots of mobile applications for kids and um, families as well. The point is, we had to do that on very small budgets, but I was still able to get it done. Okay, and the second thing is, if you ask around, people will say, oh, it's expensive to go get an app developed or a website. Well, there's always other alternatives. Okay, there's always a way to get it done for less, and I don't mean to do it cheaply. There's someone that will be passionate about your project that will help you. doesn't mean they'll do it for free, and they probably shouldn't do it for free. But there's always ways to be creative. And the one thing I can tell you is, if you keep telling your story, you know, and don't make it only about you, but if you keep telling your story, you will find that right person. And a good example of our startup community story is, been a mentor at Start Norfolk, both Start Norfolk's and at Hatch. I don't go there obviously trying to meet that right connection, but I go there to be part of the community. The last Start Norfolk, which was in April, I happened to have lunch with a gentleman two weeks after, and he happened to be the developer that we partnered with on our last application, which, so I guess we started meeting in May. The point is, I had no idea that he would be the right fit, but he was, and it was through going there and making that connection and saying, you know what, let's go grab a cup of coffee, let's go grab lunch, learning about each other's projects, that we found a synergy and an opportunity to do something that we both believed in. So you have to come to these things and you have to talk, but you also have to know what you're looking for. So in the back of your mind, you have to know, I need, you can't just tell people I need a developer. No, you need to know what type of developer, what specialties do they have to have, what the personality they have to have, have they done other businesses or successful things. So you have to know every meeting, everything you go and do, you have to know what you need. And you don't have to always ask it. You just have to know so that when you meet that right person, there might be an opportunity. So those are just a couple observations. The other thing is, I think some entrepreneurs I meet have great ideas, but they really don't execute well. So they keep talking about their idea for months and months, but they don't see action. So one, I think as an entrepreneur, you just have to get your hands dirty and figure it out yourself. I don't care if it means code or if it means put up a website or go find a customer, but move forward and don't wait for, don't say your hands are tied. They're not tied. You need to move forward and do something. Make some actionable move. And keep moving until you finally get that momentum. So that's one thing I see with some of the entrepreneurs in the area is they want to keep waiting and waiting. Or they say, I'm going to spend six months trying to get investment dollars. Well, if you had just done side jobs, you would have raised enough money to support your own business efforts and you would have been in a much better place. Because most of the time in six months, those companies or people are not getting investment dollars that quickly. Okay, so those are just some other things that I think we need to think about as entrepreneurs or when we're mentoring entrepreneurs. And then uh, let me just go into product development. So last um, December, we launched our first mobile application. Mostly before that, we've been all on, on the web. And we actually partnered with a company from Nova Scotia. The good news is, after that partnership, all my, all my deals have been local in Hampton Roads. Everyone are developers, and I've never used anybody overseas ever. So the good news is we are keeping work in Hampton Roads. But the first partnership, so the app was called Feed the Monster, and it was a 3D application. It was a novelty game, so it was all for fun. It wasn't an educational app. 
So basically, uh, you're not going to be able to see this, so I apologize because uh, Zach said don't, don't worry about slides. But basically, it's a really fun app. The point is, we had a four-page game design document, okay, requirements. Well, everybody in, on both teams agreed that everything in it was doable, and it can be done in three months. Well, reality was, it wasn't quite three months, although we did stay pretty close to that. But the price that it was going to cost to do 3D animation for all of this kept going up. Because, of course, it's in 3D. So every little change, like we said, well, their hands aren't long enough. Oops. Well, they said, oh, well, we've already done all the 3D rendering, so it's going to take too many hours to go back and fix it. Well, we didn't even want it in 3D, but we said, okay. We just wanted it to be 2D. So the point was, we had too many requirements. And what happened is we had a core product, but instead of just launching with a core product, the kernel of the greatness of it, we launched trying to have all these mini games within this application. And yes, we did do it, we did it successfully, but the problem was there were things about it that we would have changed or we realized, you know what, these two parts of the six parts that we actually rolled out were what's the core product. So I think what happens a lot of times, and entrepreneurs are very guilty of this, and even big companies, we think that the product has to be better than every other product, and it has to have more bells and whistles. But that's not the case. It really is true that a minimal viable product is the way to go. Because here's the honest truth, whether it's a web application or a iOS or a mobile application or some other product, if you get the core thing right, you will get customers, and then you continue to roll out updates. But too many people I see say, oh, we have more to do, we have more to do, it's taken us six months, not three months or a year. No, roll something out and get feedback from customers. Get a customer. So that's the other mistake, is too many of us say, oh, well, we don't have any revenue yet. Well, get something, get some revenue. And I've, I've made all these mistakes. When we launched our first site, who's had, we've had millions of users over time, but I said, oh, I don't want to put any ads on the site. It was for kids, you know. So for the first six months or a year, I said, no, I want to get at least 100,000 users a month before we, you know, go there, because it's not really going to make me much money anyways. But in, in hindsight, why not? Why not at least get some money, right, instead of wait? Because then I was just, we were just burning through our own cash. Instead of saying, you know what, $500 in every month or $2,000 in every month is better than no money in. So once again, you know, get those customers in whatever way you can and get feedback so that you can roll out a better product. So, you know, in, high, in wrapping that up, basically, you know, you really only need a minimal viable product. And if you ask your customers, if you drill back down to the core idea, you'll know what it is. And you'll save yourself time and money, and you'll meet your deadline. So that's observations from me, and I appreciate everybody being here, and I'm glad we're all part of this community. Thank you. Story about Kristen's game, uh, Feed the Monster. I've downloaded it. I've also played it. It's a little addicting. Um, the monster actually farts sometimes. Um, he burps. He burps. He burps. Uh, if you, is it the gas can? What, what does he eat to? He, uh, it's you have a to, battery. It's a battery, so you, you pull the battery into the mouth of the monster. See, I wouldn't know that if I really downloaded the game. And I was lying. Hashtag cheats, I guess. So you, you put the battery into uh, the, the monster's mouth, and then it, um, you, I guess you press it again, and it uh, passes gas. It's, it's great. Um, I, I downloaded it for my uh, girlfriend's uh, nieces, and they also love it. So um, good stuff. All right, so we're going to wrap things up. We have one last speaker. Uh, one of the greatest entrepreneurs in Hampton Roads that you've never heard of, um, Gary Warren of Ivy Watch, uh, has done absolutely amazing things with his company. Um, he currently has 11 employees, uh, sat in two and a half hours of traffic to get down here, um, and also has a book to show us um, tonight. Uh, but Gary and I met uh, over the summer and uh, since become pretty close. Um, so Gary, take it away and tell us your story. So I did bring a book, um, and, and Zach called and he said, can you, can you do me a favor and, and just come down and talk about it? He said, anything for five, seven minutes. So I'm only going to take about five. Um, but it's interesting. I have actually, just to, the, the title, the, the idea what I want to talk about tonight, um, and this is my idea of Podium Pro, by the way. You like that? <laughs> going, going blind. Is the title I want, the thing I want to talk about tonight, the title of my talk is going to be, The Answer is No. And it's going to be a very uplifting talk. 
But before I start, I do want to tell you a little bit about IV Watch. Uh, we run a little medical device company up in uh, Williamsburg, Virginia. It's the medical device mecca of Virginia. And um, if you've ever, how many of you have ever had an IV in their arm? Probably most of you, right? So if you ever had an IV in your arm, one of the things you do is you look at it and you go, how'd you know you got that in the vein, right? You come to find out they don't. <laughs> and if they leak, it's called an IV infiltration or extravasation. If you got an iPhone or something, Google IV infiltration and look at the images. It's quite disturbing. <laughs> and when IVs leak, I mean, people literally lose their hands, they lose their arms. I mean, the, the chemicals they put in you cause third degree chemical burns inside your arm. And so what are the odds of that happening? It's about one in six. So it's about the same odds as Russian roulette. And so it's pretty dangerous. So, so we sit around. So we sit around the office uh, at IV Watch, and we give bad IVs to each other. And um, so we have a hard time hiring people. <laughs> we, when we when we meet you, we actually look at your hands. To see if you have any good, good he he is looking for a job. Yeah, um, going to Salem. So, but anyway. Um, the company, medical device companies are expensive, and you know, I, I've also, just to give you a little bit about my career, I, I mean, I've been in, um, in, been an entrepreneur for, uh, well, a while, um, a long time. I worked at NASA for about 14 years, and then I started a little company called Grow Labs, but I'll talk, I'll talk about that for, in a minute. But um, the thing, you can raise money locally, and you don't need venture capital. Um, when we started IV Watch, I put together a business plan. Uh, and we got some assets from another company, only to find out that they actually didn't work when we got them, which was really bad. Um, but we raised, we put an offering out for two and a half million dollars uh, to, uh, to start the company. And we actually had a thing there that we couldn't cash any money, so we raised about one and a half million dollars. And six weeks later, we hit our number, which was quite stunning. So we, we're, right now, we are now finishing up another round. We started around about three weeks ago, a $3.6 million round, and we're about 2.2. And uh, our pipeline, that, that'll be finished up probably, I'm guessing, in two to three weeks. So between NIH and, the, and private individuals, no venture capital, there's about $9 million in this company. And it was all raised with local individuals. So, so it is possible. But I want to tell you a little bit about my career because it, it, it's interesting. Um, I started at NASA co-oping when I was about, when I, back in 1982. And so that was a long time ago. And I had to actually work a semester and go to school the semester. I've lived in two mobile homes. I've driven three Chevettes. Um, and it seems like every turn in my life, I have people telling me no, that I can't do something. And so it seems like when you start a company, even with IV Watch, um, for every person that backs you or roots for you, there's probably 100 people that root for your failure, it seems like. And actually, with social networking, I think it's probably like a million <laughs> <laughs> that don't want you to succeed, and they degrade you. So it's, it's, it's very frustrating. So the thing I tell people now, people come to me and say, what does it take to be an entrepreneur? And if you're a guy, what you need to do is go out and find the 10 prettiest girls that you can find and ask them out for a date. If any of them say yes, you're not an entrepreneur. You don't want to say no. <laughs> and if you get used to that, then you'll probably be, you can probably be. So... Anyway, I worked at NASA for a while. I, was, uh, I got two degrees in computational, my master's degrees in computational fluid dynamics. And we started a little company, and some of you may have remembered it. It was back in the uh, 90s. It was back when they were uh, near a fiscal cliff. I don't know if you all remember that. <laughs> and they shut the government down. And uh, there was a group of us that wanted to start a company. We couldn't get back into NASA to quit. It was really tough. I mean, <laughs> we the government over so we could quit. Nobody ever quits NASA. I mean, if you have a job there, you're there for life. And so I came home one day and I told my wife I quit. I was six years from retirement since I started working there from 19. She just kind of went, mm-hmm. Um, I think she still thinks I work at NASA. But um, anyway, I had, it was interesting back then. How many of you ever heard of this book? So is it really, I highly recommend you get it. It's by a guy named Clifford Stoll. And he was the author of The Cuckoo's Nest. And this book got thrown in my face so many times when I started an internet company. And I, and I was going to read you an excerpt from it and put you all to sleep, but I, I, I took my, uh, this is why that, that Podium Pro thing would be good, you wouldn't pull out your thing. But basically it talks about how email never work, and you can't see how devices like, or, you know, are going to convert so that you have like a computer and a phone. And he basically mocks everything that has come true today. And it is quite stunning how wrong this man was, but it got, it got thrown in my face about why I was going to fail. 
In fact, I, I actually stole this book from a guy named Danny Peters, if anybody can meet him. But this guy now does not write anymore. He, uh, he makes pottery. So <laughs> you can get online and, and, and buy it from him. But we, the company that we had, and if you remember your labs, we, uh, we started out, at, we were doing networking stuff back before the internet was a big deal. And, and, um, and, and unfortunately, I, I have to tell you this, we actually filtered the internet for porn. And uh, if you ever wanted to come to an interesting job interview, about how you get site reviewers to do that. It was, it, was very, it was very interesting. But we ended up selling that company to Symantec. And some of you may remember that. And we built a huge facility in Newport News, a $21 million facility. And we moved PC Anywhere here. And I was a senior vice president of all the East Coast stuff. I got PC Anywhere, all these other products they had. And I worked for the CEO. And I ran their mergers and acquisitions fund and had a $50 million fund that I could invest in. And um, Anyway, I invested, I found this company, I didn't know what I was doing, so I found this company called Brightmail, and they did anti-spam, and you, you know, and so I, I, I put 17 million of a 50 million dollar fund into this company called Brightmail, a very high valuation, and then the CFO of Semantic realized I didn't know what I was doing, he wanted me, you know, he's going to have a head and stuff, and he told me that spam is not an issue, and if spam ever becomes an issue, Microsoft will take care of it, we're wasting our money. <laughs> so, so Semantic ended up buying Brightmail two years later for $360 million, and the um, CEO of Brightmail became the CEO of Semantic, fired the CEO of Semantic, that was when I was there. So, um, so that, that worked out okay, I guess, for them, but again, I was told, no, that's never going to work. So I, then went, I left Semantic, they closed the building down Newport News, they moved everybody to India, so uh, that was an interesting meeting probably, they had to show all these people in India how to surf for porn, I would have liked to have been on I wasn't there then. So we went, and a group of us then went to a company called AppForge, which did mobile applications. Now, this was way before Apple, right? And so I spent a lot of time on the plane, and I'm going to see literally the CTO of Airtran and American. Um, I have a partner of mine with me, Marilyn Bauer. She's in the back. She's with, been with me now for like three or four companies for some reason. Um, but we went to all these people. In fact, E-Trade, we, we, Marilyn and I, we wrote this proposal for this product, and we thought, you know, we could turn your BlackBerry into a trading terminal. Man, what a great idea that would be. What an addictive app. You know, it's like gambling. You could just do that at the airport, right? And so E-Trade kind of bit. And, and we even named the product, and it was a proposal about that thick, and it was, it was great. It was called E-Trade Mobile Pro. But we didn't kind of make it in time. We had, this was a venture-backed company, and I had raised $20 million of venture capitalists with this company. I'd been there four years. And so E-Trade loved it, but the venture capitalists were kind of tired of it at four years, and they closed us close this down. Uh, E-Trade, by the way, uh, you've probably seen that with the little baby, that little, I, I can't stand that thing. Every time I see it, I want to kill it, because we never got any of the money from that. It was, uh, and, and I think Maryland's one that named it. So, not the baby, the app. I'm not even kidding. So anyway, on the closing call, though, when they were, we were shutting down AppForge, I ended up selling, I raised 20 million, I ended up selling AppForge to Oracle for 2 million. You know, you don't make a lot of money doing that. And uh, everybody got their job. I'm not sure if that counts as jobs in Virginia or not. But uh, they all moved to Atlanta. Um, but the closing message from the venture capitalist that day was, I think we have proved beyond a reasonable doubt that there is no market for applications on smartphones. <laughs> so, and if you want their name, the venture guy's names, come talk to me. Don't work with them. So these are the things I've learned, though. You know, you've got to have a great, I heard it earlier, a great team around you because you can't do it all alone. How many of you, have you all seen that new series on Bravo called Startup Silicon Valley? What a pile of shit that program is. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta, I gotta, I, I, you watch that and you think, you know, what do you, how do you do a startup? Well, you go out and you like beg for money all day and you binge drink all night. Are you serious? <laughs> I, I, it's, it's unbelievable. So anyway. <laughs> They don't have a great team around them. I mean, all it is is a couple pretty girls that can't fight on the show, but I, I'm addicted to it. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> so, if it is a joke, don't think that's how it started. So, anyway, um, you got to have a great team around you. I, I did bring, like I said, I brought them here afterwards. You want to talk to her and me? It's, uh, we've got, we've kind of got a core group that follows. Some of us, some of them fall out once in a while due to drug, drug problems and things like that, but overall, we've got a great team. Uh, they should have stuck around for the IV thing, though, I'm telling you. If you, got, if you drink a lot, I'm telling you, an IV, a sailing solution in the morning, that's great. Is this being recorded? Let's talk after. So the other thing, the other, this is my lesson learned, is avoid the art of too early, because that is so easy. It is so easy to say, wow, man, it would be really great to sell pet food or groceries on the Internet. 
Right? That was from 2000 or 1999. Web van and all they all went out of business. But we all do it now. Right? Because the art of too early. That's, that's say art of too early is really uh, is really easy to do. The other advice I have is look for simple solutions to big problems. Right? So developing, you know, a $30 million robotic surgery center to operate on a guy on Mars is probably not going to make you a lot of money. <laughs> the IV business that I'm in is very exciting for us because you know how many IVs are, IV sets are sold in the U.S. every year? 330 million. I think like 300 million people in the U.S. <laughs> so it's just, the volumes are incredible. There's 1.4 billion IVs given in the world every year. And all we want at IV Watch is $2 an IV a year. Oh, yeah, that's not <laughs> so, but you got to have a simple solution to a big problem. And the other thing I've learned is work on things that people have to buy, not want to buy. And there, it's very different things. You know, at AppForge, I'm trying to convince you know Airtran that people will want to know their flight. You know, if their flight's on time, especially if you're sitting out on the runway in Atlanta for three hours. You know, and they're like, nobody will ever do that. And so that was kind of a want to buy thing, right? And it just it was really tough, but. The IV thing, I don't know, when you go to the hospital and they're giving you like, you know, some kind of really bad drug and you're, you're thinking, how do you know that's in there? And then your hand starts to swell up. You know, I, I think that's kind of a want to buy thing. So, <laughs> the other thing is, you have to roll up your shirt sleeves and you got to work long hours. I have, you know, I'm in my 50s now. I mean, you, you probably didn't know that. I probably look like I'm like 23. <laughs> but, I mean, it's the amount of hours is, is just excruciating. And you could never do a reality show on a real startup. I mean, what are they going to do? Come in and film you working on the accounting system for 12 hours? <laughs> 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 it's not exciting. It's not exciting. In fact, I hire college kids sometimes as interns. And they think, IV watch, man, it's so cool. And they get in and say, this is so boring. You know, and they're, they're having to do plots on the computer. You know? It's ridiculous. And then they want to make like $95,000 a year. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so in closing, I, I just want to tell you this. Because I don't want to sound like my father did. You, you know, it was the, I, I walked to school five miles. And I didn't have any shoes. And it was uphill both ways. You've all heard that. And, uh, you know. So I'm going to come into, the, I came into the modern age about a month ago, because in the in, in 90s and 2000 decade, they, you know, the venture campus guys would always ask us a stupid question. What keeps you awake at night? Have you all heard that? What keeps you awake at night? What the hell? That's like when you lose your car keys, and the first question say, somebody asks you is, well, where'd you leave them? Are you kidding me? I mean, why did I ask that? Right? So, but... Uh, so I, I, in closing, I just want to tell you, if you want to be an entrepreneur, go to your doctor, say, I want to be an entrepreneur. You know what they're going to give you? Ambien. I'm telling you, that is the miracle drug. Because it, you, you, know, you know what keeps me awake at night now? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing at all. So, anyway, that's all um, you know, I have. Uh, if you haven't heard about me watching, go to our website. You'll find nothing there. It's just a logo, and the reason for that is not because we're trying to hide stuff, but, you know, if you want a, a serious barrier to entry, work with the FDA. I mean, then, you know, no matter, you have to phrase your question so the answer you want is no, and that always works. So, anyway, thank you for your time. This community has really grown a lot uh, over the over the last 12 months. Uh, I probably had 200 emails involved uh, or people involved in the community this time last year. And, you know, we have well over probably 5,000 different emails uh, that we regularly send to people. Uh, so thank you guys uh, for for continuing to support, telling other people about the community. Uh, we are the next thank mega being here, and uh, look forward to next time. See you soon.